Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. We Americans love it when it's about us. We just love it. Until we are sitting with Jesus in the Middle East, eating with our hands, and Jesus says, It's the guy sitting with me, eating with his hands. Which guy, Jesus? Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 20 to 25. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 396 of the Bible as Literature podcast recently on Thulos. We were talking about the letters of St. Paul and the situation Paul leaves you in. It's the situation Matthew leaves you in because Matthew is a disciple of Paul. The New Testament is a product of the Pauline school which is itself a product of the school of Ezekiel. This is a systematic text. And Matthew, we know, tells us that you have to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, but we all know you can't be perfect. So people hear scripture and they either pretend they can be perfect or they give up because they can't be perfect and make up an ideology that says it's okay not to be perfect or make up an ideology in which it's possible to be perfect. No one deals with the actual situation in which we are condemned because we are in a situation that is unwinnable. That is the situation in which the gospel places you. Nowhere is that more keenly felt in the gospel of Matthew than at the table of fellowship. And this reflects, quite honestly, the conflict between Peter and Paul, because that is where the bitter conflict of the New Testament, the showdown, as it were, takes place. That is where everybody's cards are exposed. That is where the secrets of men's hearts are revealed. It's all a question of who you will sit down and break bread with. So you have all of these disciples who represent the tribes of Israel gathering around the Messiah, who's just an ordinary guy. We've talked about that. And in all of this, there is a test. Will they be faithful to the words that the Father of Jesus has handed down to them to obey? Will they be faithful? Will they trust in those words, or will they betray those words? no matter what the outcome is, they're all still going to sit together at table. It's the problem we face every Sunday when we gather for table fellowship symbolically. It's the problem we face at the cafeteria when we sit down with our co-workers to have a meal because we break bread together and at the same time we are betraying each other and stabbing each other in the back by our conduct constantly. I've been working with a lot of people in India. They're fantastic colleagues because they're very accountable, they work hard, and they're good at communicating, and they're very polite. And one time it was very touching because it was during COVID and one of the members of the team was getting married. And so she shared with the entire team the YouTube link to the live wedding and we could all watch the wedding as it was happening. And it was very kind of her and it showed a way that she was very open to breaking bread with us even though we're in the United States and she's in Southern India. In the United States, someone can invite you to their wedding and feed you and give you a celebration with dancing and music 
and you go and you check your calendar and you see if it's going to be convenient for you and you know bye but I really need to go to the cabin and replace the deck that weekend I don't know if I can make it I was moved at how table fellowship was just a part of everyday life with my Indian colleague compared to what you know my actual neighbors <laughs> physical neighbors in the United States that they don't share like you said, this is where your heart is revealed. Who are you open to? Who are you willing to sit with? And for Paul, obviously, this is a big deal. If anyone's read Galatians before, you know who you're willing to sit with does reveal your heart. Are you willing to sit with the outsider? Here we are in chapter 26 of Matthew, and I'm not going to forget, and I'm not going to let our listeners forget that the end of 25 was that you don't just share the table with the hungry, the naked, the poor, the unclothed, the sick, the prisoner. You serve them at table. You are a slave at their table. That's what he says in chapter 25. So being at the table is a way of showing loyalty. Just as our soldiers tried to do in Iraq, and Afghanistan is sit down at table to have tea and break bread with Afghans and Iraqis. Ultimately, the Americans showed that they weren't loyal and that they were ready to leave and that they aren't going to be formed by the experience at the table. This matters more than Americans, I think, realize because, you know, we live in a world where you can eat in your car. You don't even need a table. <laughs> we can eat on our laps at a party without a table. Our colleague Nikolai Roddy told a story about when he was driving around Omaha, Nebraska, and he had a colleague visiting from Palestine, and this Palestinian saw Nebraskans driving around drinking coffee in their car, and he thought it was hilarious. People drinking coffee by themselves was hilarious to them. Because coffee is something you drink to celebrate, to share a table, to break bread together. That was an intimate part of their lives. Drinking coffee with somebody is something you do for that fellowship. When I lived in Morocco, it was before cell phones. If you wanted to find your friend, you would go to the cafe where they hung out. And you would ask anyone at that cafe, oh, where's Muhammad? And they say, oh, he came by earlier and then he left. We're, tell him that you were looking for him. And your friend Muhammad would find out. It's like the cafe you would go to was like your brothers and your cousins because you broke bread with them. I know, Father, you and I try to instill the podcast with some of this culture that's foreign to Americans today. It used to not be foreign to us, but it is today because of our highly individualistic society. But we need to understand that breaking bread is a sign of loyalty, accepting someone's hospitality. I was talking to Matias, my Oromo friend, and you know the Oromo show me that building community is actually very straightforward. Every weekend, you go to a wedding or two, or three, you go to one or two graduation parties, and then you help plan the parties that are coming up next month. Guess what? Your community is doing well <laughs> because you spend all your time breaking bread with other people. There's no Netflix involved. You're not building anything. It's already there. I mean, you mentioned Afghanistan. That's why Afghanistan is a mess because no one's accepting what's already there. They're going in with their, you know, clear mental map of a civilization, and they're trying to impose it on the rugged terrain of Afghanistan. Afghanistan gives life to the tribal mountain peoples, not the Russians, not the Americans, not the British, and I'm sorry to say, not the Taliban. I mean, the Taliban copying the other imperial powers is going to end up in the same result. You cannot govern the mountainous region of the tribal peoples of Afghanistan. Do we have to keep trying this over and over again until the Lord comes, until someone figures this out? You don't build Afghanistan. You don't even build community. You accept what the Lord offers with humility. The person in the car with their coffee is pursuing happiness. 
They are chasing happiness when they chase caffeine down their throat on the way to work. And it's sad because the thing they're chasing will always elude them. It will always elude them because the solution is to stop looking for something for yourself and to start serving others. That's why Dr. Roddy's friend, the laughter of Dr. Roddy's friend is a divine laughter. God is laughing at us. Why would you imagine that drinking coffee alone in your vehicle would be of any value? Why not teach your children to serve coffee to guests? Because in doing so, your children will learn duty and service and humility, and you will build a relationship with someone else, and you will think about something other than yourself. But those people other than yourself are already there. There's nothing to build. I want to keep coming back to that point, Richard, because just in the way that we speak in this country, building community, how can you build what the Lord has provided? It's hubris. We can't talk this way. You don't build community. You know who builds community? Colonists build community. The Native Americans didn't build community. That's the key point. <laughs> now, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12 disciples. So we've already set the stage in our preamble to this passage. We're talking about the Passover meal, but we've got the 12 disciples disciples, the 12 students of Jesus. We have this metaphor of the Messiah with the 12 tribes gathered around the table of fellowship. If you read just a few verses ahead, you know it's a Eucharistic metaphor. We'll come to that in next week's episode. You also know that we're going to be dealing with the question of betrayal. So already in the this moment, we're in a situation where perfection is being demanded of everyone gathered around the teacher. And it's not clear that only one of them is going to fall short. So we're stuck with a table fellowship marred by betrayal. I love the example you gave. It's fabulous. Because we Americans feel good about ourselves when we see the nice, young American soldier taking a selfie with his arm around someone from Afghanistan. Look how much we love the children of Afghanistan. Or look how close we work with these tribal leaders in Afghanistan. You see, we're all friends. We care about them. But it's not real. It's fake. Please don't give me a lesson in psychology about me not being allowed to judge their feelings because their feelings and 50 cents will not pay for the cups of coffee required to solve the current problems. It's not a question of people's genuine feelings. I don't even know why you have to say genuine. It's either a feeling or it's not a feeling. It doesn't amount to anything. What matters is what's happening. That's why you can't govern Afghanistan because you're too busy trying to figure out what you think instead of understanding what Afghanistan is. Just listen to what we're saying. You comfort yourself because the selfie of the American soldier holding hands with Afghani children is comforting, but it's not true. It's not table fellowship. And now we have the evidence that it's not table fellowship. That's how judgment works. That's why no one can judge in Matthew before the time. Because if you look at the selfie, you think, oh, the Americans are so loving and caring. <laughs> you have to wait until the Lord comes, and then we'll see where the love is and where the love is missing. If this dinner feels suspicious to the American because it feels like a loyalty test, that's because in this culture, in this time, and in most cultures, and at most times, any time you sat down with somebody, it was a loyalty test because you were sharing your resources with somebody else, and you brought them inside your house. Anything could happen at this point. And if we read ancient Greek literature, 
hospitality was the virtue. And we even see it in the problem of Sodom. The problem of Sodom, according to Ezekiel, is that they didn't show hospitality to the stranger. They abused the stranger and his concubine. We have a dinner where you show up, and it's not just about taking, having a bite to eat, and then moving on to your next party like we do on graduation parties among Americans in the suburbs, but you show loyalty to the one who showed kindness to you. You owe them something. You do owe them something. If nobody owes anything to anyone, you don't have community. You don't. Here, I think there's an interesting ambiguity in the manuscripts because it says that the disciples did as Jesus told them to do. They made ready the Passover. But then in verse 20, it says that he sat down with the 12. Only some manuscripts include disciples after the 12. And I think that's interesting because it makes it broader. Jesus sat down with the heads of Israel, and let's see what happens. It doesn't emphasize the fact that they are his disciples, although that's perfectly logical to supply here, and we see that it is in plenty of the manuscripts. But I think it's interesting if we take that other option about what was being conveyed, and it's a broader picture Usually the disciples are just a gang of people. We don't know how many people are there. We don't know if they're men. We don't know if they're women. We don't know if they're young. We don't know if they're old. It just says the crowds, the disciples. But here it says the 12. Like you said, it emphasizes the heads of Israel are now sitting down with the heir to the throne of Israel. And now they're going to have a meal to show who's loyal to whom. As they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, that one of you will betray me. We've commented on this in the past, that it's interesting he doesn't name specifically who will betray him. And he mentions the betrayal while they're eating. Eating is a really, really sacred human act. Eating can be an act of utter selfishness and self-service, or it can be an act of fellowship. There's so much ritual surrounding food. Who gets to eat first? Where people get to sit? Who provides the food? Making sure that the children eat while the father speaks, because the father is providing the meal. Not, I need to get my food so I can eat. So the disciples always seem to be preoccupied with food. And here, Jesus waits till they're stuffing their faces before he points out that one of them is going to betray him. It emphasizes, as they're satiating themselves, it emphasizes the scandal, the betrayal. Not the scandal in the Matthean sense, because I know you have a particular thesis you're working on around the use of that term by Matthew. I'm using that word in a more general sense. That's embarrassing. It's a scandal in the modern sense, Richard, that they're going to betray Jesus, someone's going to betray Jesus, and they're stuffing food down their throat. What are you trying to say, Jesus? You don't trust us? You don't believe in us? Why did you invite us? The way you do a business deal is not like this. Imagine, Father, a vendor invites several people and says, I know after this meal you're going to do business with my competitor and not with me. What is everyone going to say at the table? No, 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 we're not. No, we're not. Even if they're totally planning on doing business with the competitor, they're going to say, no, 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 we don't. No, no, we don't. No, we don't. And this is just having a meal at the local burger place in suburban Minnesota. We have this in our bones. We know that when someone supplies you with a meal, you're not allowed to do that. And guess what? No vendor would ever say that because no one would want to have a meal with that vendor ever again, whether they or not they wanted to do business with them. You don't do it. Jesus goes outside the lines here and calls a spade a spade. I know you don't believe in my teaching. I know you don't trust my teaching. I know you're not interested in listening to my father, and I know how this is going to end up. Good luck. We're just about done here. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, surely not I, Lord, classic denial, as you were just saying, Dr. Benton. And he answered, he who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. Again, 
in terms of literature, it's interesting that he doesn't say, oh, don't worry, it's Judas. It doesn't say that. It never actually says that. It never actually says that. We'll see as we go through. I mean, readers will draw their conclusions. But right about now, what I'm thinking is the more people rush to say, it's not me, (laughs) the more I'm thinking it's probably them. If you know anything about Scripture, can you honestly point to anyone who hasn't betrayed Scripture, who hasn't betrayed the Son of Man? Do you think that there's anyone here who's true blue? That's how you have to hear what's happening. You have to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect, and you can't be. That's why you should not feel okay when you approach the chalice on Sunday because you went to confession. If you feel okay, then confession was to no avail because what you should receive in confession is the gospel where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So you should walk away from confession clearly aware of the sin. And the grace is the corrective from Scripture, which explains to you your sin. So how could you feel okay? You should approach mindful that it's not okay. That's the position Scripture puts you in. It makes you mindful that it is not okay. When someone tells you don't worry about it, that's the person you should be afraid of. Because Scripture never says don't worry about it. Scripture says you're sitting at table with Jesus and you are about to betray him. You're at the table, and you're about to betray him, and you better not. So now what? You're next in line. What are you going to do? You're stuck. And don't take this as a fundamentalist and start getting worked up. This isn't a question of fundamentalism. You have to hear this and understand what is being taught. You are being taught by God's instruction to be honest with yourself about your situation in life. You are being taught not to self-justify because the scariest person in the world is a person who feels justified. They are dangerous and frightening. A person who feels justified feels that they are in a position to tell you it's okay. And only God can decide on that day what is okay and what is not okay. Are you kidding me? Sin is not okay. And the fact that the one you're speaking to is a sinner and you are a sinner means that neither of you has the right to say that it's okay. All you're left with is Matthew's admonition that you must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect, and we all know you can't be perfect, so now what? The fact that they begin very sad, but then ask the question, is it me? There is a subtle contradiction there. Why are they sad? Are they sad because one of the other people is going to betray him? Maybe. That's it. Maybe they feel bad that they're in the company of such terrible people. Or do they feel sad because they themselves know in their hearts that there's something that they're not accepting? The question, though, is it me, Lord, is tricky because they want Jesus to let them off the hook. If it's one of the other guys, then they can shake their head and say, poor guy, you know, he didn't measure up. And if it's them, they say, shoot, I'm going to have to figure out how to do this better. When the question is, what did I do to betray Jesus. You have to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, and that implies that you're paying attention to where you're not perfect. You go to confession as a reminder of the very specific ways that you are disloyal. It's a loyalty test. Peter just says, oh no, I won't be scandalized. I'm going to stand on that, but there's no way that I'm going to betray you, Jesus. These are sad and reflective, but they won't come to terms with their disloyalty. Ezekiel 20 is talking all about the kind of new exodus that's going to happen as he brings the people out of exile in Mesopotamia, as opposed to the original exodus where he brought them out of exile in Egypt. In the second exodus, they're going to remember their guilt. They're going to remember why they were sent into exile. These 12 at the table 
are not doing that. They're not paying attention. They're not remembering. They're not reflecting on the reasons why they also either were in exile or deserve to be in exile, whether they received one sort of grace or the other kind of grace, but they're not seeing their own heart. They're waiting for the teacher to tell them. It's like saying to the teacher, is this going to be on the test? And the teacher says, you have to know everything for the test. So anything's fair game. Do you know it or do you not know it? I'll leave that up to you and we'll see how you do on the test. Anyone who's eaten a meal in the Middle East knows that everyone eats from the same dish. Everyone dipped their hand in the dish with Jesus. Everyone will betray Jesus. Except the Minnesotans, Rich. If the Minnesotans were there, they would have used a fork. Or they would have been <laughs> or they would have been licking their fingers and no Middle Easterner would would dip their hand in after they did. Something would have gone wrong and then the Minnesotans and quite possibly the British would have been off the hook in their minds. <laughs> <laughs> the we already want to take, like you said earlier, Father, we want to take the end of the story and read it in. He didn't say that Judas is going to betray me. He says the one who dips his hand in with me, which is all of them. He's saying none of you are loyal. None of you are loyal. We don't hear this in verse 23 because we automatically jump to 25. But 23 is saying they are all disloyal. None of you are loyal. So you're asking, is it me? He says, look, if you're at this meal, if you're eating, then the answer is yes, it is you. The son of man, who I'm very proud, like the rest of us, eats with his hands, is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born ominous, uncomfortable, if Jesus is saying it's the guy who dipped his hand in the plate at a table with no forks and no napkins in one plate. (laughs) And they were all eating. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That is such an unpleasant statement. I love that line in Basil's liturgy. And I say it as slowly and clearly as possible every year. For we have done nothing good upon the earth. I love that statement. It's so clear and so beautiful. It functions the same way as Jesus' statement here. Whoever dipped their hand in this plate that we all have our hands in, you're the betrayer. Whoever is here gathered in the church, be it known, we have done nothing good upon the earth. Just be aware of that before you approach the chalice. In case you feel justified, we've accomplished nothing. We haven't obeyed the Lord's commandment, and we've borne no fruit. That is pure scripture. Ezekiel 20, starting in verse 42, And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I lifted up my hand to give it to your fathers. So this is talking about the new Exodus, bringing them into the land. And there shall you remember your ways and all your doings wherein ye have been defiled, and ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that ye have committed. You go into the land, but the difference between this and the first Exodus is you're going to remember precisely what you did. It's not like, did I do something wrong that I should remember? No, you know what you should remember, and you're not going to forget it. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have wrought with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O Yahweh house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Because of what you did, the Lord should have eliminated you entirely and not brought you into the land. Because the Lord wants the nations to respect his name, he shows that he can take something out of this ragtag group of good-for-nothings and make a people out of them. And this is what is happening when Jesus is sitting with the twelve. And I'm going to say the twelve on purpose here because I want to say that it parallels this recreation of Israel, knowing that all of you betrayed me. And woe to you, it's better for you that you hadn't been born if my father decided to do 
what he could have done as a result of your actions. But because of his name, he decided anyway he was going to allow some some students to remain so that they could continue to teach. Honestly, this is where the name Iudas in Greek, Judah, becomes highly functional again. Because once you understand, as you said, some manuscripts say mathites, some don't, but it's the twelve representing the 12 tribes, whether you say disciples or not, it's clear, Richard, what you're saying. Suddenly at the end, in verse 25, when you hear the name Judas, you realize we're talking about, once again, Judea and Judah and the special function of the tribe of Judah, but you're talking about all of Israel. The tribe of Judah was a central tribe. It was a main tribe. It was a chief tribe. And this is important to recognize and understand because just as the New Testament demotes Caesar, remember that Christ replaces Caesar and takes over his title. You have here the 12 gathered with the Messiah and to the extent that Judah is their head, Judah is not their head, Christ is their head. And Judah, their former so-called chief tribe, as it were, is the representative or the face of the betrayal of Jesus by the Twelve. So Judah becomes the symbol of the tribes, complete betrayal of the Messiah. Now, in John, it's a different story. We're talking about Matthew. Specifically in Matthew, every last one of them is party to the betrayal. It's not a question of historicity or who's guilty. It's a question of what the author is trying to say. They all ask the same question, is it me? The only slight difference is that the general response is, is it me, Lord, Kiria? But Judas is, is it me, Rabbi, Rabbi? He says it in Hebrew or Aramaic, either one. It's the same word in both languages. And so when he asks... He refers to this aspect of Jesus as the teacher. That's the only difference. Judas, we know, is betraying him by accepting money in order to turn him over. But we also know that the other ones betrayed him for free. We're going to find out how they all just left him and betrayed him and left him to the Romans without getting any silver from the chief priests. As you said, Father, no one is good at this table. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.